Tonight on KQED Newsroom, the firefighters gained the upper hand on the Kincaid Fire as thousands of evacuees returned to their homes in Sonoma County. Also, the impeachment inquiry into President Trump enters a new phase with a key vote on Capitol Hill as Democrats go on the offensive. Plus, smoke from the Kincaid Fire has triggered air quality alerts for the Bay Area. We'll hear from an expert on how best to protect yourself. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Sarah Farmer. We begin tonight with the Kincaid Fire in Sonoma County and its impact on residents and business owners. On Friday morning, Cal Fire reported that the Kincaid Fire was roughly 70% contained. The blaze has burned more than 77,000 acres and destroyed more than 300 structures in Sonoma County. Residents began returning to their homes Wednesday. Many of them fled to evacuation centers in Santa Rosa and Petaluma, staying there for several days. Some have lost their homes, their pets, or faced smoke damage or lost income from jobs or businesses that had to close. Joining me now are Terry Hardesty, who was forced to leave her home in Windsor, and Martha Bodell, who had to temporarily close her business in Santa Rosa and Windsor because of the Kincaid Fire. Thank you both so much for joining me today, especially considering what's going on in your lives. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Martha, you own a business in Sonoma County, North Coast Tile and Stone. Uh, you have offices in Santa Rosa and in Windsor. What was the impact of the Kincaid Fire on your business? Both businesses were shut down. Um, effectively, the power went out first, and then we were evacuated from our Windsor slab shop, which is where we do all the slab fabrication and installs. And our um, sales design center was also shut down for three days, actually four days. Um, same reason for evacuation and no power. And I would think, I mean, really, it really kind of um, hitchhikes on the original Tubbs fire, this is two years into that, so we're installing people's homes that have been out of their homes for literally two years now and that are at the end of their money, at the end of their homes that they've been renting to move in. So the emotional impact of not of delaying people's jobs now again two or three weeks, maybe longer. Um, the financial impact is huge. You can't, we have 80 people work for us to not be able to pay people for almost a week's worth of work. for eight, I mean, that's impacting people's rent. It's impacting every kind of fine you can imagine in our payroll system because we haven't been able to do any kind of bookkeeping. So it really is a trickle-down theory. And I think one thing that's really um, misleading is people talking about on social media, you know, don't, big deal, you don't have power for a couple of days, you know, with how spoiled we are. And really, it's it's really not about that. People live week to week in Sonoma County. People don't have money to restock their refrigerators and their freezers again. This is the second time this has happened for us. But in terms of, I'm sorry. Now, what was the impact then on your workers? Because half your workers were evacuated from their homes as Most, well, right? Um, we had almost everybody that works for us was evacuated, maybe 80% evacuated and 20% without power. So where do they, those people go? Everyone has kids, other jobs, and now they have no money. And the impact of just, you know, them with just basic food in their refrigerator that's gone bad and then having to replace that, it's the things that sometimes we take for granted, we right? take for granted. Yeah. And that people don't have extra money to do that. Yeah. Terry, you had to evacuate on Saturday as well. Um, how did you find out how to evacuate and? <laughs> yeah. What happened? I mean, it's all so surreal. It just seemed like a regular Saturday, and I had had coffee with a friend. Went back to my place, was getting ready to go to a service that I usually go to, um, and um, all of a sudden, I'm standing out there in my driveway, and a sheriff's deputy comes flying up the driveway, and you know those high-low sirens that go. They're new since 2017 that the county has installed, so that you know that it's an emergency. And the deputy came up to me and said, you need to get out now. And this was like at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so uh, I knew to take it seriously because in 2017, we were on sort of, you know, alert, but we didn't have to evacuate. But when, when a sheriff deputy comes up your driveway and says, get out, you do it. 
So. Yes, please. <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. And what, what's the hardest thing about being evacuated? The hardest thing for me was just uh, the not knowing what was going to happen. The, and I mean, I grabbed, I had time to think, unlike they did in 2017, where they had flames at their back and they just ran out their house. I had time to think. Uh, grandma's pictures, definitely the dog and the cat. Um, and just thinking about what what are you going to go through? What, are we going to have a home to come back to? How bad is this thing? And just not knowing, I think, is the hardest thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as of um, you know this taping, there's still parts of Sonoma County without power. Yes. Um, without water. Yes. Per your experience, Terry. Um, when did the lights go back on for you? And uh, Martha, how has not having power affected your business? Well, basically, I mean, it shut our fabrication shop down because all of our, um, we have six saws all run through the internet with power. And actually, we're still pretty dead in the water because a satellite tower caught fire la night before last. And that, we have no internet still at our shop. So everything, all of our machines that have been offline because of the power out interface with Italy and Minnesota. So we can't interface to get our machines reprogrammed to run them to cut granite. So we're doing as much as we can old school by hand, dragging saws by hand and trying to get, you know, we're hobbling along barely, but it still is impacting us. So yeah. the amount of work that's going out is maybe, I mean, I don't even know if we're getting any kitchens out yet, to be honest. What would you say, Terry, that the psychological effects from the fire, the Tubbs fire in 2017, how did that affect you and how does that relate to what's going on right now? Well, I, I feel like Sonoma County is a different place since 2017. And people are already psychologically, um, you know, they haven't really even dealt with 2017. A lot of people are in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And then to put this on top of it, and for myself, well, I didn't have a home burned down, but I have many friends and family members that have had, and now they're being evacuated. Everybody's traumatized in some way. It has affected everybody in that community. And when you throw, you know, another evacuation, power outages, and we're all wondering, is this the new norm? Are we gonna have to go through this in the future? We can do it one time maybe, but that's enough. It's too hard to psychologically go through this. Yeah, I, I actually lived in Napa in 17, mm -hmm. and so I wasn't under mandatory evacuations, but I had to leave my home. I was terrified. I mean, yeah. you, know, you wake up in the morning and the sky's gold, you know, and, and, and it makes me think about communication, right? So mm -hmm. how do you both feel about how PG&E officials and um, other first responders, per se, have communicated in the evacuation process? Well, I feel that there were a lot of lessons learned from 2017 and that the county really was prepared. Mm -hmm. um, they've had two years to put in all kinds of alarm, new alarm and alert systems. Everybody has gotten on what's called Nixle, which is uh, a text alert that we all get, that we all learned right after the fire. We all wanted to be connected because we weren't before. So that really was a good communication tool that we were given um, alerts every day. Um, of course, we'd like more. Everybody wants one every hour, but we, we got them when important information was coming down. So I felt confident with that. As far as PG&E, I feel um, they really tried to inform people and were pretty transparent. I was really impressed with them when they actually said that it was their fault, yeah. the transmission line. That that was transparency, and I think yeah. they learned some lessons, too. Yeah, it's, it's, I think they're trying to step up their game, but um, Martha, for you, I mean, you know, how did how, how do you move forward in 2000 from 17, then to 18, we had another fire. You know, I mean, we we've just they just keep coming. So how do we all move forward with you, with your business, with your workers? I can't. I mean, it's just just like Terry was saying. It's just so emotional for people that I think really just understanding that everyone has a story and understanding to be super patient with people and. We have, you know, a lot of people lose their temper, lose their, they're upset. 
-hmm. They're crying. The elderly community especially is affected. Yeah. Yeah. I think with PG&E going out, you know, many, we have huge senior community that are sitting there in the dark. And the yeah. cold. And the cold. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe don't have cell phones or, I mean, it's just, it's, it's been a lot for our community, financially, emotionally, on yeah, every level. Else, right? Mm -hmm. Terry Hardesty and Martha Bodell, thank you so much. I truly appreciate you both, and I wish you the best in moving forward. And um, but I'm glad you're safe. Thank you yeah, so much. You. Yeah, you're great welcome. to be Thanks with for you. Having us. Thank, thank you. On Thursday, House Democrats passed a resolution laying out the rules and procedures to guide the impeachment process of President Trump. It also lays out due process rights for the White House and marks a turning point in the probe with public hearings into President Trump's request that Ukraine investigate his political rivals. Earlier this week, decorated Army officer and Ukraine expert Alexander Vindman testified on Capitol Hill. Vindman is the first White House official to testify who listened in on the phone call President Trump made to Ukraine's leader asking him to investigate Joe Biden. Joining us now are KQED politics and government correspondent Marisa Lagos and NPR senior editor and correspondent Ron Elving. He joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Hello. Hello. Good Hello. To be with you. Hello to you both. Thank you. Ron, let's start with you. This final week in October has been an intense week in politics and the case for impeachment. What are two of the biggest obstacles that Democrats face with the uh, impeachment process moving forward? Well, two big obstacles are, first, it's complicated. It takes some concentration, a little bit of attention. People may need to read things, and things might need to be explained. And people don't necessarily always have a lot of patience for that. They have other things to think about in their lives. The second biggest challenge is getting over what will be a ferocious resistance from the Republicans in the public hearings, uh, the people who are supposed to be in the room and the people who are not supposed to be in the room will be trying in one way or another to distract from the proceedings and they will be trying to uh, fill the airwaves and the social media, Twitterverse, with uh, their denunciations of the entire process and that's going to be very distracting. Marissa, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that Ron has it. And, and this is one of the reasons I think Democrats waited till this point, is that they feel like the Ukraine issue is easy to understand, that this is clear cut, that it is something that any average American, whether they understand the intricacies of the Constitution, can get why it's troublesome for a sitting president to ask a foreign leader for help, uh, you know, getting dirt on a political opponent. But I think that there's a lot of anger on the left that this didn't come sooner, on the right that it's happening at all. And so one of the reasons that they're doing it now, of course, is to bring this out into the open and to really bring back some of those folks who have had, you know, who have been behind closed doors to make that case clear. I think, to Ron's point, whether people are going to pay attention is, is another question that we are going to continue to ask. Right. Absolutely. Um, Ron, President Trump and other Republicans had really harsh words for uh, Army Colonel uh, Alexander Vindman after his testimony this week. I mean, he's a decorated Purple Heart recipient, a military hero. Uh, and GOP Representative uh, Liz Cheney spoke up for him. Him, um, and against his defamation of character, calling it, quote, shameful. Uh, what do you think is the significance of her defense of Vindman and the risks that conservatives run by questioning the patriotism of someone like him? Well, the significance is that you have to go some before you get Liz Cheney to speak ill of another Republican or even to chastise another Republican. She is a highly partisan, loyal person. She is, of course, the daughter of former Vice President Dick Cheney, a member of Congress and a member of the leadership in her own right. So that was significant. And it was a warning, I think, to her fellow Republicans and fellow conservatives not to go there. Don't question the patriotism of these people. Question their interpretation, question their information, say maybe they're secret secret Democrats, but don't question their patriotism when they are wearing their decorations on their uniforms sitting before you and have served so honorably for their country. Right, right. And do you feel that she drew the line in the sand for other Republicans to say, you know, hey, we maybe we shouldn't cross this line here moving forward? There are many ways to try to undermine the veracity or the the credibility of a particular witness. And this is just not the avenue that's going to be most fruitful for them. Right. Do you think that impeachment will happen before the end of the year, or do you think it'll happen in 2020? I think the House is trying very hard to get public hearings going in the month of November to have the House Judiciary Committee 
act in the month of December and possibly even have a House vote before Christmas, but it gets increasingly difficult as the holidays approach, so it's probably more likely it will happen in January, and certainly the Senate trial would then follow in January, February. What do you think, um, Marisa, about the risks of taking an impeachment into January in 2020? How could that weigh negatively against Democrats? I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Because on the one hand, they want people focused on the primaries, on the caucuses, on their candidates. On the other hand, you could argue that this, the longer this drags out, the worse it is for President Trump. I mean, there's not a huge expectation that he would get convicted in the Senate. And so if you are in a moment in, you know, as we continue to approach November 2020, where this is still in the headlines, Lines. You know, I, I really think it could go either way. I also think that from Democrats' perspective, they do need, they, they shouldn't sort of hold themselves to an artificial timeline. I mean, the, the last thing that they want is for independents, particularly moderate Democrats, even some Republicans, to feel that this is being rushed through for just for political partisan reasons. And so I think that, you know, they do need to let themselves sort of take the facts where they lead them. Well, why do you think uh, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, was hesitant? to bring a vote to the floor up to this point anyway. You know, what, what, do you, what do you think her strategy was in that? I mean, I think partly she just was didn't have to, and so she didn't want to give the Republicans that win. I think now, at, at a certain point, she's essentially saying, hey, like, let's call your bluff. If you guys are so concerned about the process, let's figure out the process, and we can do it. Um, I also think that this was the moment where it made sort of procedural sense. If they do want to have these hearings in the House Intelligence Committee out in the open, if they do want to actually draft those articles of impeachment in a way that the public understands them, they were going to have to take some sort of vote eventually. Um, I guess you could, you, could, you could argue whether they had to take it right now, but I, I do think that there's sort of a dual purpose here, which is one, calling Republicans bluff, because it's not as if they've changed their tune now that this vote has been taken, but also that they see that this is sort of a turn in the process that was going to happen at some point, and the sooner, uh, as we were just talking about, so in some ways, maybe the better. Right. Ron, um, what do you think that fellow Californian and House uh, Minority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, is, you know, yesterday he was saying that Democrats are trying to impeach the president because they're scared that they can't defeat him at the ballot box. Uh, how do you think the messaging will play towards voters in the, two in the election coming up in 2020? The Republicans don't really want to defend what the president did. They don't really want to defend the substance of that telephone call. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, that's not really impeachable. It might not have been exactly the right thing to do. The president prefers to call it a perfect phone call and says he may go on uh, radio or television and read it all, read the transcript, and maybe he will do that. Uh, but generally speaking, the people in Congress think that it's a better play to just say, folks, this is politics as usual. The president didn't really do anything wrong. You don't really want to get into the guts of this whole thing. Let's just move on to the election in November and um, let, uh, let that dynamic play out and let that be the nation's judgment on Donald Trump. So are we seeing a change in public opinion towards this one way or the other? The country is almost perfectly split on this question. It's almost 49 to 47, 51 to 49. We're back and forth right around the 50-yard line. There's probably not going to be a huge break in public opinion on this at any point. But then there really wasn't with Richard Nixon either before he resigned. Not until he actually was about to resign did support for his impeachment go over 50 percent. And with Bill Clinton, it never went above 30 percent. So. Public opinion is a factor here, no question, and the Democrats have risks in terms of what this does to their political prospects in November of 2020. But you can't wait for public opinion to lead on this. You have to follow the facts and do what Congress's responsibilities are. Do both of you feel like though this could backfire and, and hurt Democrats uh, in the election coming up? I mean, I would say after 2020, or 2016 rather, who knows, right? I mean, Trump has done a very good job of sort of whipping up his base um, and continuing to sort of plant these, sow these seeds of doubt. And I think that what you see now is Republicans, even ones who maybe, to Ron's point, are not happy with what happened on that phone call, in theory would, per, you know, would would support impeachment if this were, of course, a Democrat, um, they are still looking at those polls and they know how strong of a surrogate Trump is, how many uh, senators and Congress people have lost when he's come out against them on the Republican side. Um, and so, you know, I think it's one of those things where, like, we are in a new moment here um, under Trump that makes it really hard to predict.
Yeah. Ron, do you think it's going to backfire? Democrats have a lot at risk here. They not only have a, a, a confused field of candidates of their own running against Donald Trump next year, people who don't really want their own fortune to rest on these impeachment hearings, but they also have a number of vulnerable, let us say, Democrats, something like 30 districts that are now represented by Democrats voted for Donald Trump in 2016. So you're really asking those people not only to vote against the man they voted for in 2016, but to vote now for a Democrat who supported his impeachment. You're asking for a lot, so there's a real risk here. These hearings need to turn up solid, substantial stuff if the Democrats are going to prevail. Ron Elving from NPR and Marisa Lagos from KQED, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. On Thursday, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District issued a fourth consecutive spare the air alert this week due to smoke from the Kincaid Fire. Wildfire smoke contains particulate matter that can irritate airways and harm lung function, especially for children and those with illnesses like asthma. And while a mask can help filter airborne particles, it's important to know the right one to use and how to use it. Joining me now is Dr. John Balms, a professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Sir, there is a lot of smoke right now coming from the wildfires. Will you walk us through what's in wildfire smoke that can be harmful to our lungs and to our airways? Yes, so wildfire smoke I like to say is somewhat similar to tobacco smoke without the nicotine. So there are fine particles, carbon particles that we call soot, and a lot of nasty compounds on the surface of those particles, um, some of which uh, are highly irritating to the airways. And then there are irritant gases as well. So it, wildfire smoke can trigger these respiratory problems. Um, is there new research then that I mean, so we're inhaling it, I mean, and we're dealing with a lot of fires right now. What is that? Are we going to see increase in numbers in people with asthma and other problems? Yes, uh, we have very strong literature uh, about the respiratory health effects of wildfire smoke. So we will likely see increased uh, health care utilization, emergency department visits, hospitalizations for people with asthma and other lung disease. What we've been learning about more recently, last few years, there's also a risk f for people with pre-existing heart disease. So there's uh, evidence from California. It was a joint study of UCSF, California Department of Public Health, and US EPA investigators that showed increased emergency department visits for cardiovascular problems like heart attacks and strokes. And that was in 2015, oh, wow. which was not even as bad as the current smoke problems. Well, I, and one of the things I find fascinating is that there's differences in fire in general, right? You've got forest fires, you've got fires at home, and then in the home you have these different synthetic materials and plastics that are super toxic. I mean, firefighters we know have higher rates of cancer, but for everyday people who are now inhaling these forest fires that seem to come regularly every year, um, you know, what's the difference really between you're out and, you know, the fires we're having right now versus one in your home? Well, if it's a pure forest fire, you know, up in the mountains where no structures or motor vehicles burn, then it's wood smoke. Uh, unfortunately, these catastrophic fires we've had the last couple of years have taken out neighborhoods, the Coffee Park neighborhood in Santa Rosa or the town of Paradise. So then when synthetic materials in homes and cars burn, then there are even nastier uh, toxic materials than regular wood smoke. And the firefighters have to deal with this all the time, right. but now the public is, people downwind in Santa Rosa from the Coffee Park neighborhood probably inhaled some nasty synthetic material smoke. So what can people do to protect themselves if they're outdoors? Well, they can wear an N95 mask. You know, I have one here. Um, they have to be put on so that they fit tightly over the... Oh. Mouth and nose, there's actually a metal piece for forming it around your nose. Um, and the protection depends on fitting well. So, you know, I have a beard, so there'll be a little leakage around my uh, face. 
but I still get some protection with this. Well, what about kids, though? You know, we've got little ones, and, and I always feel for them because you there's things just don't fit them all the time. So what do we do about our kids, and, and what can we... Great question. So for these to be effective, they have to fit well. So unfortunately, they're made for adults. Even the small uh, version doesn't really fit kids properly. So it's not officially approved, the use of N95s for kids. Um, they should stay inside. Really? <laughs> yes. And then for somebody like me with a beard, um, it fits pretty well because I don't have a big bushy beard, but I don't get a, the same protection as you would wearing one of these. But I get some protection, so where, it's not wrong we, to wear these. Where do we get those? Uh, well, nowadays, uh, I think you can get them at most hardware stores because okay. uh, people use them for construction work. Uh, and you can also get them off of Amazon and other internet sites. Uh, and then they're often distributed for free uh, by local jurisdictions. Sir, it seems like wildfires are here to stay. What concerns do you have um, as a physician about the long-term effects of these fires um, on our environment now and for future generations to come? Well, on the environment, it's going to be a problem. Uh, and with regard to the health effects, long-term health effects, we just don't have the data. Uh, but uh, we're trying to learn about long-term health effects by studying the wildland firefighters because they have the most exposure over the longest period of time. So do you think we'll see more cases of asthma in the future? Well, we'll see exacerbations of asthma related to these wildfires and whether the fire smoke can cause asthma in susceptible people, that also needs to be studied. Dr. Balms, thank you so much. My pleasure. Really appreciate you coming in today. That'll do it for us. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Zara Farmer. Thank you for joining us.